Hello and welcome to the 18th and penultimate episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Saturday the 16th of July 2022 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. Today we read the Paul Matic 1970 introduction to the Fundamental Principles. This week I have the new patrons C and Sneak Cat to thank. If you like those extra patron-only episodes and creating Discord over on the Discord server, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Also, if you'd like to donate to the Socialist Planning Book Project based upon these very same fundamental principles that Donald and myself are working on, why not head over to the website, the Classless Society in Motion.com, where you can find out all about it. Every donor to the project will get a signed copy of the book upon release their name in the acknowledgements and get to join in a reading group just like this one once it's released. The link to the palmatic text is included in the show notes. Okay, to the discussion. Today we are reading the 1970 introduction to the book by Paul Matic, the famous Dutch, is he Dutch slash um, American? I thought he was German, actually. The German slash American Marxist, a left communist Marxist, I think could be fair to call him. Uh, let's see what they say here on the Wikipedia. He was a Marxist political writer and social revolutionary whose thought can be placed within the council communist and left communist traditions. Okay, so there's, there's a, a quite a quite a long introduction here by Paul Matic. I suppose we might as well start from the beginning and see who wants to put up a hand and we get going on this. Alan. Okay. The collectively written book presented below, The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution, is now being published for the first time in 40 years. Its authors, members of the Group of International Communists of Holland, participated in the council movement. Councils first arose during the Russian Revolution of 1905. According to Lenin, even though they could have seized political power, although they actually remained on the margins of the bourgeois revolution. For Trotsky, the workers' councils represented, unlike the political parties active among among the working class, the proletariat's own organization. The Dutch theorist Anton Panikowik saw the council movement as the self-organization of the proletariat, which would lead to its class rule and control over production. With the conclusion of the 1905 revolution and the end of the councils, interest in this new form of organization subsided, and the organization of the workers' movement was once again in the hands of the traditional political parties and trade unions. Later, the Russian Revolution of 1917 once again brought the perspective of the councils to the attention of the international workers' movement, this time not only as an expression of the spontaneous organization of the revolutionary workers, but also as a necessary measure to confront the counter-revolutionary policies of the traditional workers' movement. First World War and collapse of the Second International marked the end of the first phase of the workers' movement. What was foreseeable long before, that is, the integration of the workers' movement into bourgeois society, became an irrefutable fact. The workers' movement was not a revolutionary movement, but a movement of workers who were trying to adapt to capitalism. The workers themselves, as well as their leaders, lacked any interest in abolishing capitalism and were content with the trade union and political activities within the prevailing system. The meager achievements of the parties and the trade unions within bourgeois society expressed the real interests of the workers. Nothing else could have been expected since a vigorously expanding capitalism rules out any real revolutionary movement. The ideal of a possible harmony between the classes and the course of capitalist development upon which the reformist workers' movement was based was smashed to pieces in its collision with capitalism's own contradictions, which are manifested in crises and wars. Revolutionary ideology, which was at first restricted to a radical minority within the workers' movement, spread among the masses when the misery of the war exposed the real nature of capitalism, and not just that of capitalism, but also that of the workers' organizations, which had emerged within it. These organizations had escaped from the control of the workers. Their existence merely served to perpetuate their bureaucracies. Because the function of these organizations was bound to the preservation of capitalism, they can only oppose any real struggle against the capitalist system. 
a revolutionary movement effectively needs organizational forms which go beyond capitalism, which give the workers power over their organizations, organizations which embrace not just part of the working class, but all of it. The council movement was the first attempt to construct an organizational form adequate for the proletarian revolution. Both the Russian as well as the German revolutions found their organizational expressions in the council movement. But in neither case did they prove capable of asserting their political power and using it for the construction of a socialist society. While the failure of the Russian council movement must undoubtedly be attributed to the general backwardness of Russian social and economic conditions, the defeat of the German movement was the result of a lack of willingness on the part of the working masses to realize socialism in a revolutionary way. Socialization was seen as the job of the government and not the task of the workers themselves. Thus, the council movement decreed its own dissolution and reestablished bourgeois democracy. Okay. The meager achievements of the parties and the trade unions with, within bourgeois society expressed the real interest of the workers. Nothing else could have been expected since a vigorously expanding capitalism rules out any revolutionary movement. Like, I, I kind of agree with the overall thrust, perhaps, of this, but I think it's somewhat overstating the case that there was not revolutionary, large level, rev revolutionary elements existing in, say, European society at the time, even around World War One. Like the, the German socialists seem to be split, you know, 50, I don't know, it's 50-50 is a fair expression, but certainly a large portion of the, the SPD was, still had revolutionary intent. What do people think uh, are, is problematic over expressing the kind of lack of revolutionary motives in in the working class at this time chris well i think he he has a point because he was a first-hand witness of the german revolution at least I, I mean as a teenager which is amazing to think some 16 17 year old participating in, in all of that but in terms of the german revolution i'm sure He's right to say that, you know, if, if there were if there were radicals, they, they would have been a pretty tiny minority of, of the overall population of workers, which is disconcerting to think that the amount of trauma that the working class underwent in the First World War, and it wasn't quite enough to raise their consciousness to the level of thinking of an alternative to capitalism. I, I, that's, uh, I think that's a little problematic especially going forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a problem. Uh, Slavic. Uh, so from what I've read, it's, it's definitely the case that the uh, centralized trade union leadership was definitely a barrier, uh, not just within the trade union movement, but also they played an increasingly important role in the SPD as well. And so... I kind of, I'm, I'm not sure if we can quite say that, you know, if the leadership maybe was different, I, I don't know if we could expect maybe the exact same result, but uh, certainly the, the trade union movement did have some, at least the leadership had some conservative elements to it. But I think we can also see that there were lots of, lots of dissent in the rank and file regarding that. But to what extent, I, I, I'm not sure. Like, would it be fair to say that, like, in, in, in Russia, the Bolshevik was the revolutionary tradition and the Menshevik was more the parliamentary tradition? And But, you know, it shows how, like, you know, you know that in Russia, it, you know, things, I know that the material conditions are different, but we, we do see that, you know, the revolutionary side did manage to get control. I think the, the kind of thing to understand i think from from a lot of the revolutionary stuff i've kind of been putting my head into lately is that like you know you don't need uh, like it, if you look to history it's not like you need 50 51 percent of the population to be active revolutionaries to get a revolution to happen you need the you need a kind of a a, a, a majority in the places where power resides and where you can control key thing so that's something for us to think about as well oppose this is going against the general 
the general gist of like the McNair approach of building up a majority, but just just to say that from a, a strictly kind of historical point of view, we often see revolutions happening with large proportions of society essentially neutral. Kielce first. I always think it's instructive that these workers' movements weren't able to oppose the start of the war and a lot of what followed after that from from, from my point of view felt like falling into line with, with lines of thought promoted by the by the elites yeah absolutely like i i think you know hopefully the working class can learn from history they can learn these moves to divide and conquer through war in particular as one of the most you know ruthless kind of moves by the bourgeoisie to maintain their control uh slavic yeah so i think maybe what illustrates his point the best is the fact that as my understanding is that there wasn't nearly as strong of a trade union movement in Russia due to the repressive nature of it, whereas in Germany there was a pretty very active trade union movement, and we can see where the councils originally started uh, having kind of the most extreme sort of are able to do the most right, and it's in Russia where trade union movements aren't aren't competing with it i guess so i think that's one factor that might be in his favor and then i i would agree with your point like not necessarily 50 percent of the population needs to be on board right before a revolutionary moment but that when people start seeing that there's lots of power or that you know, this potential movement could be a vehicle for their grievances and they're actually, you know, antagonistic and gaining some sort of demonstrating to show them that they have teeth or that they have power, that they're not just, you know, falling into reformism. Then I think that's a big factor for a huge weight of the population falling behind those uh, movements. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me go on here. And look at this next little bit here. Um, revolutionary ideology, which was first restricted to a radical minority within the workers' movement, spread among the masses when the misery of the war exposed the real nature of capitalism, and not just that of capitalism, but also that of the workers' organizations which had merged within it. How many people today, I suppose that it's still like, say, I just talk about, say, in the UK, where there's an establishment Labour Party an established Labour Party, people, I think, really do look to them still as, they, they still look to them as, you know, on their side, you know, the established, the establishment Labour Party. You know, what, what you know, it, it's hard to think, if, you know, we're not in revolutionary times. So it, it's hard to think of what conceivably could cause, say, a rupture within uh, the UK, say, for example, just as a, as a, as a, as an example, to lead to a revolutionary party today, that people could get to this realization that the that the labor and the unions are actually not on their side. What what do people have anything to say about that? I know it's hard reading this into today's. It's maybe a bit unrealistic. Kielce, I, I think a bit less of revolutionary times than just desperate times. You know, the, the, is it? Isn't it really like the shortage of food and the just desperate inability to just live normal lives? That's that's a large part of what's really attracting these people to to, to extremist positions at this time. And if it were to happen here, you'd have you'd be the equivalent of I don't know food riots because of Brexit and a breakdown in the economy because just massive you know incompetence by the government. In in Ireland, you're seeing Sinn Fein capitalising on a completely dysfunctional housing market and and if that you know that, that can, you can see you could see a successful left-wing movement here doing something similar if, if, it, if it continues the way it's going where people just don't have access to housing anymore that sort of thing yeah i think that like for me the the two great kind of things pointing towards the promise of something approaching a revolutionary politics in the western countries is obviously i think is global warming one I, I think secondarily, then, I I think, uh, you know, outside of America, you have in America, you do have the kind of racial issues, which has a kind of revolutionary component to it. But I think that's probably overstated. But but also, I, I think the the returning to a, a rentier 
proletariat, a proletariat who is, has to rent and not able to afford to get on the housing. I think that's definitely something that is pointing towards people to really get pissed off and struggle to maintain a high standard of living. That's That, to me, is undoubtedly something that's happening. Alan? Yeah, I I sort of agree and disagree with some of what's been said here. Like, I guess, uh, like, obviously, a, a desperate time is going to be when you would expect to, to see, like, social unrest. But I don't think that's necessarily revolutionary in nature because, you know, if, if you're going hungry or you're homeless or, or anything like that, that's exactly when you could be kind of, I don't want to say placated, that's dismissive, but essentially that's when that's when reforms can be tossed out as like a way of getting around it. And you would have to like, you have to accept it at that point almost. Whereas, you know, earlier when, when Maddox said, you know, during a, what like vigorously expanding period of capitalism, there's no potential for, for revolution. Like, well, maybe, but like, also that would be, that would correspond to a period of like higher wages, lower unemployment. And that's when the, when the working class would have like more, I guess, capacity to, to like take real risks and would have more, more ability to kind of nourish its own intellectual life and, and reach these more revolutionary kind of ways of thinking. Yeah. Sometimes I kind of wish that was true too, but I, I feel like it's, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. If, if, if the government can then throw people some, some stuff to, to calm them down, then, then things tend to, to calm down, but they they can't always do that or they don't want to always do that. So that's how the French Revolution happened. They were too incompetent and the Germans were obviously they were losing a war so they couldn't do anything either and same with Russia. So I guess that's that's why it's revolutionary is because it's the combination of desperate times and also the inability of the government or the unwillingness of the government to do anything about it. A contradiction between the ruling classes for some reason or other but and also like wartime conditions. These also make... A difference but also like underlying that nothing will change unless there is actually organized revolutionary people at the time so what how how much of the, how much of that is a what would you say a deterministic element uh, i think is not something i want to talk about today but um yeah that that's interesting okay let's let's read this a little bit here a revolutionary mo- movement effectively needs organizational forms which go beyond capitalism, which give the workers power over their organizations, organizations which embrace not just part of the working class, but all of it. The council movement was the first attempt to construct an organizational form adequate for the proletarian revolution. Now, is that true? Like, what what about the Paris Commune? It's like, the council is not just like a slightly updated version of the Paris Commune. Or is the Paris Commune not just explicitly just kind of cancels? I'm just literally about to start reading the Civil War in France. Anybody who's read that? Chris, you've read a lot of this stuff. Uh, I have read the Civil War in France. And there are parallels between the Commune and uh, Council system. Of course, the, the Civil War in France is a pretty short, you know, sort of also slightly polemical text by Marx. It, it doesn't go into the nitty gritty per se of like, what workers were organizing what in, in this part of Paris or like just a general overview of how the commune sort of administered itself. But uh, I, it would be interesting to know explicitly what uh, workers were doing in Paris, you know, like h- how they were self-organizing, not just a bunch of, uh, you know, Blanquistes and Proudhonists forming little uh, revolutionary bands or whatever no it's interesting i I, i'm sure there there were parallels but obviously it i I don't think paris was quite as industrial then obviously it was just beginning it certainly wasn't like you know london at the time so there's another line just directly after this where he says about the councils but in neither case this time about russia and germany but in neither case did they prove capable of asserting their political power and using it for the construction of a socialist society. Like, that gets to me something about this council form that I don't, like, it seems to me that the council form, as it has occurred so far in history, has not become an executive form, has not allowed itself to become a, a, a form for, like, directing society in any real way. 
it seems to have been much more a a form of nearly protest or a, a ensuring the local workings of this factory or whatever is done in a proper way. From what I've read of of, of a lot of the council stuff, that we we've just read the, the the fundamental principles. To me, I I I think of the council as the the kind of the way I would like a communist society to be run. You know, the unit as opposed to like a a capitalist firm being the unit. We have our workers' council and an, an operational unit being the the kind of organizational form for the for the new society but it's not like the boardroom you know the 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 capitalist firm that organizational form is not used for say political parties uh they operate there are different types of organizations so this idea of the council being the thing that will bring us revolution bring us into this new state to me seems to be a question that's really critical because i think you know probably some critique we'll get of reading the gic this book and the principles is people say oh well, you think you're going to cancel your way into a revolution which i don't think is true what do people think like about this council form as a kind of a an ability for the workers to have an executive kind of function to get towards revolution as opposed to a you know factory operational unit which didn't really manage to scale upwards that well i don't think historically anybody have any any thoughts on that what was your point with uh, it not being able to scale well well like where where in history did we see the the council form we had the revolution in in uh, like you can we've had like the emergence of lots of councils okay but not the higher levels federated levels and those actually managing to have effective executive control and to use the power of the councils through society that's the kind of point i'm getting at not that they didn't proliferate at the base but the conglomeration of them together as a as a operational unit hasn't seemed to be like that efficient a tool like if we if we look to Russia, you know the the Bolsheviks were able to manipulate them. They were able to take them over. They were able to bring the unions in. They were able to destroy the council system. In Germany, the council system got destroyed. Like the places where it did come up, it didn't show itself as being able to battle in you know, a political revolutionary landscape. These other uh, other forces, they got, literally got rolled over. Right. So is that? Is that a problem with the? So you're saying that that's a maybe points to a problem with the council form, as you said, an executive, as being able to achieve an executive function, correct? Like I can imagine they'd be able to do it. Like once you had the revolution put in, you could design your federations. But like I mean, just from his his history, like we haven't seen the, the them being able to to put that into place in the revolutionary moment to have an effect. Like it's much more easy for like an existing party, like say the communist party in China or the communist, the Bolsheviks in, in Russia or whatever to, or the SPD day in Germany, because they have all these structures that are built before people actually take over the workplaces in these councils, that they have these organizational structures, they have, you know, top-down command and control systems or whatever type of systems they have, they know how to function. They have specialized units, blah, 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 blah. And then in the revolutionary moment, we have these councils popping up left, right, and center all over the place. All these firms having, you know, becoming controlled by workers' councils. But all those higher levels of, like, uh, of operations, strategy, tactics, you know, specialization, they have don't have a history of existing. And they're up against, you know, the bourgeoisie, these com- communist political parties or social democratic parties that or bourgeois parties that have it, you know, and they're obviously so far in history, they haven't been able to, as an as a organization form, compete with those others. Herman. 
Uh, yes, from from what I understand, uh, how the group of international communists, uh, how they argue, is that the the councils are the political organization, but um, it needs the content what what they what they have to do with this organization. So so that's just the organization to take the power is of course not enough, and the awareness what to do with this power. So how to organize. Um, with this organization, um, their economy. This was uh, was not existing so far. So, and this was the reason why um, the workers, while they used the organization, uh, the, the the council organization in Russia to take the power, they were not able to defend their organization against uh, the Bolshevik party and their uh, economical program. So I think the argumentation of, of the group of international communists is if the workers are aware what they have to do with this uh, council organization from an economic point of view, then they, 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 they could, could do this. But this was historically not the case. So what would a movement, what would a council communist movement Look like that. That would be the case. Do you think, Herman? I think they, they have to understand the fundamental principle of communist production and distribution. If if they have understood this book, then they they would know if they take power by the the, the council organization, then then they would uh, immediately know what they have to do. But if if you see uh, the discussions in 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 Russia the, the workers were not aware of what they have to do with with their council organization this you could could see when when the discussion came up during the the tenth um party congress um, where the uh, workers opposition came up and and, and criticized uh, the bolshevik party it was a, a within the party uh, criticism where they said the party is um The, the, the council uh, organization um, needs more power again, but but they had no content. They, they, they did not really know what to do with with the council organization. They criticized uh, the Bolshevik party that they were they were destroying the council organization, but this was without economical content. So therefore, their criticism was so weak. Yeah, so it's interesting. Like, so, so, like, just I'm just uh, completely uh, making stuff up here on, uh, you know, now just totally making stuff up here. So, forgive me if I'm being really dumb. But, like, so, are we saying that, like, a a a communist movement that we want to introduce something like the GIC that we should prefigure our say, <laughs> I don't know what we would say, like, uh, our organization, our party, or whatever, uh, based on a workers' council federated all the way up like we should model our party based upon the kind of end situation whereby you know different factories have different votes and we organize and vote democratically that way for our party organization do people think that is a like a a possible formation for a a a, a communist party actually design it at root based on these fundamental principles? I'm not sure. I certainly think that the component that Herman's speaking of, which is like the party has an overall strategic understanding of where it wants to go. So it wants to pick this route as opposed to a cartel approach. That would certainly help. I'm not sure if the Bolsheviks, I think their organizational form, I mean, it was still pretty democratic, but it was constrained by the Tsarist regime at the time. And so it, it took a form to adapt to those circumstances. I, I wonder if it's, if it simply would have been adequate to have the, like for the Bolsheviks to take power and simply have the right ideas. That seems to be kind of the, uh, the case here possibly, but I also wonder, you know, when councils do form, a party of some kind would need to create some sort of accountability to the councils. It, it can just be a completely separate organization. But if you don't have councils existing yet, then I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, let's move it on. Alan, are you good to read the next bit? It was Alan, wasn't it? 
While the Bolshevik Party had taken power under the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, it acted in accordance with the social democratic conception that the construction of socialism was the task of the state rather than the councils. While no kind of socialization was carried out in Germany, the Bolshevik state destroyed capitalist private property without, however, granting the workers any rights over production. However much it defended the interests of the workers, the result was a form of state capitalism, which left the social conditions of the workers unchanged and instead actually continued their exploitation for the benefit of a new privileged class. Socialism could be realized neither by reform of the bourgeois democratic state nor by the new revolutionary Bolshevik state. Aside from the objective or subjective immaturity of the situation, the road which could have been followed to achieve socialization remained enveloped in obscurity. Socialist theory generally tended to involve the critique of capitalism and the strategy and tactics of class struggle within bourgeois society. The road to socialism and its structure appeared to be already prefigured in capitalism. Marx himself had only left a few basic indications concerning the character of socialist society, since, practically speaking, it is hardly worthwhile to concern oneself with the future, with situations that cannot be understood based on the present or the past. Contrary, however, to later interpretations, Marx did make it clear that socialism did not refer to the state, but to society. Socialism, as the association of free and equal producers, lost its original meaning. The characteristics of socialism of the future, already contained within capitalism, were not identified with the possible self-organization of the producers in production and distribution, but with the tendencies toward concentration and centralization which were typical of capitalism and which were to finally give birth to state domination over all aspects of the economy. This conception of socialism was first assumed and then attacked with the accusation of being an illusion by the bourgeoisie. The end of a vast revolutionary movement like that of the councils does not rule out the possibility of its reappearance in a new revolutionary situation. Besides, one can always learn from defeats. The task of the council communists after the defeat of the revolution did not consist solely of propaganda for the council system, but also of an investigation concerning what the movement lacked, which led to its defeat. One of its shortcomings, perhaps the greatest, was the fact that the councils had absolutely no clear position regarding their role in the socialist organization of production and distribution. Since the councils were based in the factories, the latter should be the starting point for the social coordination and synthesis of economic life and it is within the factories that the producers must have power over what they produce. The fundamental principles of communist production and distribution constituted the first attempt on the part of the council movement in Western Europe to address this problem of the construction of socialism on the basis of the councils. So there's nothing really controversial in that too much based on what we've read already. You know, it's interesting that Maddox says one of the, one of the shortcomings perhaps the greatest, was the fact that the councils had absolutely no clear position regarding their role in the social, the socialist organization of production distributions. You know, I, I think that seems to be, I, I don't know if that is as true of the anarchist organizations, but I think it's probably pretty true of the Marxist organizations. The next question is kind of what I was also getting to, trying to get towards previously. Since the councils were based in the factories, the latter should be the starting point for the social coordination and the synthesis of economic life. And it is within the factories that the producers have power over what they produce. So, like, to me, you know, like, there is, you know, under capitalism, we have bourgeois political life, and then we also have economic life. And in capitalism, we have bourgeois political forms and bourgeois economic forms. And you know, the idea that the council, the, this very, very clear notion of the importance of the socialist council as an economic form is, you know, I think undeniable that to me now is just absolutely true. But like the the idea that the council itself is a political form, this is the, this is the thing that I am uh, struggling in my head to come to terms with when we have to, we, we read this book, we agree with everything, and then we say, how do we incorporate this into, say, political life under capitalist rule? Because we can't introduce it to we can't introduce it to the economic life yet under capitalist rule. How do we how do we fuse our politics with this notion of the of, of a of the future economic structure? That's that's the great kind of unanswered question from me from reading this book that 
this this text here brings forward. I think I'm probably just repeating myself. If anybody's had to say, jump in, Alan. Throwing in my own dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do it. All right. What could possibly go wrong? You just uh, you you use the existing bourgeois state to uh, pass some kind of law protecting a uh, a new type of cooperative organization. Call it a, a nonprofit or whatever, and it happens to be based on these accounting rules. And now you can, uh, you know, start up these uh, cooperative organizations, and it seems perfectly innocuous and not political at all. And it it develops itself kind of under the radar. Okay, but like you'd still be in the capitalist economy competing with non council based firms. You'd still have the pressure then, you know, the social, the, the economic pressure to undercut all the rest. The general same problem that the co ops mm. are I faced you with. Would, you wouldn't be. Okay, so this organization wouldn't be selling its products in the general market. It would be, they would be distributed to its members according to its own labor time accounting rules. So it, it's sort of self-contained in that way. But I would say, again, like, you, you you know, you do not have, you're still going to be taxed within the other system. Look, I, I, I'm not against the cooperative movement, but I, I, I think, you know, which tries to do a similar thing. Like, you, you, you still have, your FIC, is, you're still going to be taxed on this stuff outside, you know? How will your FIC work you know, I think if we're relying on board to sneak something into bourgeois law, bourgeois law can the minute it becomes any type of a, a threat, will just outlaw it. So I think it's yeah, yeah, that's true for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's more of a power. I, I think these things are much more about power. Like it's like, do you have the power to implement your this overall, or can you exist like a permaculture as a niche for middle class people who want to have you know organic food? I'm not. I'm not trying, trying to be too critical, but that, that's just my my instinct. Okay, well, we keep going. Who wants to read? Alan's had two goals. Who's up for the next bit? Chris. Taking into account the great difficulties confronting a possible proletarian revolution, at first glance, this work, which is for the most part concerned with the unit of calculation and accounting in the communist economy, may seem strange. Since the details of the difficult political situations we can expect to encounter cannot be exactly known in advance, on a theme of this kind, we can only devote ourselves to speculation. It could turn out to be easy or difficult to destroy a particular social system. This depends on conditions which cannot be foreseen. This work, however, is not about organizing the revolution, but about post-revolutionary problems. And says, since it is not possible to predict the state of the economy after the revolution, one cannot even set out an advanced program of the work which must be done. But it is possible to carry out an anticipatory discussion of the procedures and instruments which are necessary for the establishment of certain desired conditions or desired social conditions. In this case, conditions which are considered to be communist. The theoretical problem of production and distribution in communism became a practical problem after the Russian Revolution. But this practice was determined from the beginning by the concept of centralized state control, which was the common heritage of the two wings of social democracy. The debates concerning the realization of socialism or communism did not touch upon the real problem, that of the control of the workers over their production. The debate revolved around how to carry out economic planning directed by a central authority. Since, according to Marxist theory, socialism knows neither market nor competition, nor prices nor money, socialism was conceivable only as natural economy, in which, by means of statistics, both production as well as distribution are determined by a central office. It was upon this point that the bourgeois critique focused by claiming that under such conditions, rational management is impossible because production and distribution require a measure of value such as that provided by market prices. So as not to anticipate the arguments presented on the issue in the fundamental principles of communist production and distribution, let us just say that its authors 
have found the solution to the problem, found the solution to the problem of the necessary unit of calculation and the average socially necessary labor time as the basis of production and distribution. They meticulously demonstrate the practical application of this method to the two moments of social reproduction. And insofar as it is a matter of utilizing methods to obtain particular results, their reasoning is perfectly logical. The necessary precondition underlying the use of this method is the will to achieve a system of production and distribution of a communist type. Once this assumption is granted, nothing stands in the way of this method, although it cannot be the only one suitable for communism. According to Marx, all economy is an economy of time. The division of labor is arranged for, and the increase in the productivity of labor is implemented in accordance with the demands of production and consumption. And just like in capitalism, labor time is the measure of production, but not of distribution. On the basis of prices, the regulators of capitalism, values are linked to labor time. The relations of production and exploitation in capitalism, which are simultaneously market relations, and the accumulation of capital, which is the motive and the motor force of capitalist production, exclude an exchange of equivalent values as measured by labor time. It is not for nothing that the law of value rules the capitalist economy and its development. On the basis of this fact, one may easily imagine that in socialism too, the law of value must be valid. Since in socialism as well, labor time must be taken into account in order to have a rational economy. But labor time is transformed into labor time value only under capitalist conditions in which the necessary social coordination of production is subject to the market and the relations of private property. Without capitalist market relations, there is no law of value, even though it may and perhaps always will be necessary to consider labor time in order to adapt social production to the needs of society. It is in this sense that the fundamental principles of communist production and distribution speaks of average socially necessary labor time. Okay, so there's quite a little bit in that section. Okay, let me go back to this. There was a sentence that popped out here. Since the details of the political difficult political situations we can expect to encounter cannot be exactly known in advance. On a theme of this kind, we can only devote ourselves to speculation. It could turn out to be easy or difficult to destroy a particular social system. This depends on conditions which cannot be foreseen. This work, however, is not about organizing revolution, but about post-revolutionary problems. So this work, however, is not about organizing the revolution, but about post-revolutionary problems. Like that to me kind of is a little bit undialectical, I must admit. Like Marx called like, you know, his writing of capital, you know, like a weapon for the working class, like an understanding of capitalist political economy. Like I kind of feel like this book is a weapon for the working class. You know, it's not merely a, a thing that we can push off into the future, a post-revolutionary. It seems to me that this idea and understanding of what we're working towards is intrinsically linked to to what we would what we would do to get to that that situation like i think the idea of a non exploitative system where there is no, you we destroyed the wage system where exploitation is impossible says something fundamental about the politics of the people and the methods of which they're going to get to that position okay then on the next page let me just find this a little bit here okay they meticulously demonstrate, this is another quote here, they meticulously demonstrate the practical application of this method of public calculation and accounting of the two moments of social reproduction, production and distribution. And insofar as it is a matter of utilizing methods to obtain political results, their reasoning is perfectly logical. The necessary precondition underlying the use of this method is the will to achieve a system of production and distribution of a communist type. Once this assumption is granted, nothing stands in the way of this method, although it cannot be the only one suitable for communism. Uh, I wonder what people made a, a, of this section here. I found it both somewhat confusing, and I, I thought the way he just threw in, 
although this cannot be the only suitable uh, measure for communism. I found that kind of like a, quite a, like a disparaging comment about all the theoretical work that goes into it, the deep understanding of why a non-exploitative labor time wage is the unit of calculation. Herman. I think this is this part is the starting point of his uh, criticism of the fundamental principles because now he starts to say, yeah, this is a method which is uh, valid, but uh, it's not uh, only suitable. And then later on, he comes and, and says that this is because um, much of the work can be automated. And so this is not really necessary, the labor time accounting in the way. But I think before he starts with this uh, critique, there is one thing which I think is simply wrong. Uh, in the sentence before, he said that um, the necessary unit of calculation in the average socially uh, necessary labor time as a basis of production and distribution. And I think this is not right because uh, the argumentation was that the individual working time is a measure for the consumption and not the average, um, for the social average working time. So it's the individual working time on the production side and the, the social average working time on the, uh, on the the individual working time on the consumption side and the social average working time on the production side. This is uh, uh, the argumentation that the individual working time has to count. In, in capitalism, there it's the case that uh, the individual working time is valued uh, by the uh, social average working time. And so I think he is really mixing it up here. Yeah, absolutely. Like, what did you make, Herman, at this bit when he says, as, and so far as it is a method of utilizing methods to obtain particular results, their reasoning is perfectly logical? I found that sentence quite confusing. <laughs> Yes, I, I feel he is saying, yes, it's uh, <clears throat> the fundamental principles. Um, it's quite logical. But later on, he argues that it's not necessary. So I, I think he, he, he does not really stand behind this argumentation. The argumentation of the group of international communists is that this working time calculation is the basis of communism. And he says, yeah, it's it's you, you can't say anything against it, but later on he argues that it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah, I think his arguments for it being not necessarily not necessary are incredibly poor. Ones based on like current productivity and inefficiencies of capitalist production. Exactly. I think it's a very myopic understanding of the problem. I think he does kind of get it right, though, again, like, I think you're right, he said he mis mis he's kind of clumsily says it here, but he kind of does say then, on the basis of prices, the regulators of capital, oh, sorry, the division of labor is arranged for and the increase in productivity of labor is implemented in accordance with the demands of production and consumption. And just like in labor time, just like in capitalism, labor time is a measure of production, but not of distribution. He kind of doesn't get it right up top and then kind of seems to point towards it there again. OK, well, let's go on to the next bit. Chris, that was a good long read. I'll give you a rest on your phone. Who wants to take the next bit? Slavic. The authors emphasized the fact that others had previously proposed labor time as a unit of economic calculation. They considered this proposal to be unacceptable because it was based solely on production and not on distribution, and in this respect was still related to capitalism. From their point of view, Social average labor time must be valid for distribution as well as production. At this point, however, we encounter a difficulty and a weakness in calculating labor time, a difficulty which Marx had also taken into consideration and not discovering any other answer besides the abolition of calculation based on labor time for distribution, he puts forth the communist principle from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. In like, his can we can we just stop there and point out how that's totally wrong? Like that's not what that's not what Marx did in in the critique of the Goddard program. He did not say because you know there is a weakness of calculating labor time that there there are problems with labor time accounting. He put forward each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. That's just a plain misreading. I think that's fair to say, Herman. I, I'm not being too harsh there, am I? 
Yes, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's a, it's a common misunderstanding. So Marx is, is writing several pages on, on the working time calculation, and then he adds one sentence on the higher stage of communism where he says that in a higher stage you can have this principle from each according to his abilities and to each according to his needs. So this is only one sentence he adds, and uh, Matik uh, and, and many other people as well. They simply ignore that he, he has written um, more than a page on the, on the working time calculation before he, he adds this sentence. So, so he really turns it uh, upside down. Yeah, it's it's incredible bad interpretation of what Marx said. You know, it's it, it's kind of shot, you know, it is it is the kind of typical thing you do here uh when it comes to the critique of God program from Banny Lefcoms, I must admit. But it's like it's for me it's just a complete and total misreading. Okay, Slavic, sorry to interrupt there, but it just it stuck in my craw trying to let that paragraph pass without comments. <laughs> no problem. In his critique of the Gotha program of the German Social Democratic Party, Marx highlighted the fact that distribution in proportion to labor time would imply a new inequality, since the producers are characterized by different capacities for labor and by different personal situations. Some work more intensely in a given time period, some have families to maintain while others do not. Therefore, the equality of distribution in accordance with labor time would cause inequality in the conditions of consumption. Marx writes that, quote, in effect, with an equal amount of work contributed and therefore with equal access to the social consumption fund, one obtains more than another, one is wealthier than another, etc. To prevent this unjust situation from arising, the law must be unequal rather than equal, end quote. While he considered this inconvenience to be inevitable in the first phase of communist society, he did not consider it to be a communist principle. When the author of the authors of the fundamental principles say that their presentation is, quote, only the consistent application of Marxian thought, end quote, this is true only insofar as that thought is applied to a phase of socialist development within which the principle of the exchange of equivalence still prevails, a principle which will come to an end in socialism. Let's just stop her there again. <laughs> Herman, what do you want to say about this section here? Yes, I, I, I think once again, Marx, he, he writes uh, in a, a communist society, he, he, has, he has both in a, in a lower and in, in a higher stage, he speaks about a communist society. And here, Matik, he, he says that, that Marx did not consider it to be communist principle. So he, he says the, the working time calculation is not a communist principle. But this is simply, simply wrong. Marx wrote that this in a communist society, this is an inevitable principle. Yeah, it's right there in like the first hundred pages of Capital as well. It's not an obscure thing. You know, what I really hate about Marxology is when it's done like this, when it's, you know, taking things out of context, picking sentences. This is this is why I kind of don't like Marxology a lot of the time, because uh, it's very easily misused. But uh, I think this is particularly bad uh, use of it. Slavic. Yeah, so he's somehow saying that it's not fundamental, even though it's pretty explicit that it's needed to at least start a phase of communist production, correct? Uh, that's what Marx is saying. Yeah. Like, and you I, can't skip the, the first phase and go to the second one. We don't even know if we'll ever technically get to the second phase, right? Yeah, and he never, like, it, Marx did also did not say when they get to the second stage that they've stopped recording labor time. Let's get that oh, straight. Oh, that's true. That's a good point, too. I think the argumentation of uh, Paul Matic goes in the direction of, of uh, production in kind. So he sees that uh, a communist society is uh, is production in kind. And the working time calculation, yeah, this is a, is a first socialistic phase or so. It's it's fine. But uh, in the end, a communist society is, is a production in uh, production planning in kind. And I think this is absolutely wrong. Because in the, in the in the book of the fundamental principles, 
they really show that it's it's not possible to to have a production planning in kind. You need uh, the measure of the working time uh, calculation in in order to relate your consumption wishes to the necessary uh, work which is needed for this consumption. If you have not this relation available, then you cannot make a rational calculation. And and therefore, I think he he absolutely goes in 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 the direction of. Uh, planning in kind which which anarchists do and which was also the idea of the of the Bolshevists. does he actually say in kind or is he just imagining like an infinite pool of resources that people can just pull from is this not the same in the end <laughs> yeah i think he does tend to like i i think he's he, you will see it like as we get further on i think he his logic is that you know you could do it now and we could get rid of all the all the stuff in capitalism that we do not uh, need now that we have a communist society. And then so we'll be we'll have, you know, half the people won't be working in these other sectors. So then we'd be so productive. We could just give everything away. That's his underlying argument, you know, and that we don't even bother with labor time because, look, we'll just be so efficient. We can just do we'll just make stuff and just like give it away. That's his general kind of. That's that's where he goes with his argument, you know, which is kind of like just in kind with no labor time planning, which is it's kind of weird. It seems to be like for left communists, as far as I can see, and even anarchists, it seems to be the dominant idea towards what communism is, which is just like, let's not bother trying to <laughs> like plan stuff to a great extent and just give shit away, which I don't know, I find kind of mind boggling. Kielcher. I'm puzzled because it feels to me like handling, you know, how to move on from, from labor value um, time calculations is exactly where the book is actually very strong because it took, spends a lot of time talking about how you can buy some things with, 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 with consumption, but other things will just be available as you need them. And, you know, the mechanism for moving things backwards and forwards out of those, out, you know, out of those two, two production states. And, uh, and and even really sort of mapping out how you eventually get to a situation where you don't need labor time calculation anymore. So, yeah, I, I, as a critique, I, I, that he hasn't even engaged with that part of the book is strange. Yeah, I don't think they say you can get rid of the labor time calculation, but they can get rid of it for consumption. Ah, yeah, I get you. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Okay. So is, is, is that a, is that a point that he's making? That I don't think so. We'll get there and we'll clarify it more. But I, I think it's like that is a point he could make, but it's not the point he's making. Okay, uh, where do we get to? Okay, I think I know where we are. For Marx, it was clear that, quote, all distribution of the means of consumption is only the consequence of the distribution of the means of production, end quote. And that, quote, when the means of production become the property of the workers themselves, a distribution of the means of consumption, unlike the current one, will result, end quote. The possible shortcomings of a system of distribution according to labor time cannot therefore be overcome by means of a separation of production and distribution, since the control of production on the part of the producers also implies their control over distribution, just as the determination of distribution by the state, its allocation from above, also implies state control over production. The authors of the fundamental principles justly emphasize the fact that the producers must have the fullest opportunity of controlling their production, but that this would require a form of distribution in accordance with labor time is another matter entirely. Yeah, what is he saying, another matter entirely? So he's basically saying you could do it some other way. Okay. And the book is fundamentally saying you can't do it another way because that will allow the ability for exploitation to come back in. Okay. So he's saying, yeah, yeah, that all makes sense. All makes sense. Grand. Yeah. And then just goes, but you could do it some other way. Right. That's his general point. I find this quite confusing. Let's see. The possible shortcomings of a system of distribution according to labor time cannot be therefore overcome by means of a separation of production and distribution since the control of production on the part of producers also implies a control of distribution, just as determination of distribution by the state also implies state control. They justly emphasize the producers have must have the fullest opportunity of controlling their production, but that this would require a form of distribution in accordance with labor time is another matter entirely. Like, 
<laughs> I don't know what's to be said here. He, he, he's trying to say, yeah, yeah, the book, yeah, they, what they said is right, but also uh, we can just we can do this shit some other way entirely. I, I just find this a very, very strange argument. You know, fundamentally, what makes the labor time calculation good is that as a measure, it destroys the ability of exploitation by linking your production with your consumption. Full stop. It just it it short circuits that ability there. And when you say, well, we can do it some other way entirely without saying like what what it is, why it's different, why it's not, why does it stops exploitation or anything, how we can operate as a measure to help plan society. It's just, it, you know, it's just completely just throwing in a, a line there that negates entirely the whole argument of the book. It's it, it's kind of, it just drives me mad, this kind of way of writing. Keep going there, Slavic. In the advanced capitalist countries, that is, in the countries where a socialist revolution is possible, the social forces of production are sufficiently developed to produce means of consumption in overabundance. More than half of all capitalist production, as well as the unproductive activities associated with it, totally disregarding the productive forces which are not exploited, surely have nothing to do with real human consumption, but only makes sense in the irrational economy of capitalist society. It is clear then that under the conditions of a communist economy, so many consumption goods could be produced that any calculation of their individual shares of average socially necessary labor time would be superfluous. The attainment of a state of abundance already potentially realizable presupposes, however, a complete transformation of social production based on the real needs of the producers. The transformation of capitalist production into a system of production oriented towards meeting human needs will not just bring, as a result of the abolition of capitalist relations, a change in the form of industrial technological development, but will also thus provide greater security for the future of human existence, which is now so obviously endangered. While the fundamental principles justly puts the accent on the fact that production is conditioned by reproduction, and while the starting point of communist production can only be the end point of capitalism, the new society in any case needs adequate modifications in the goals and methods of production. The procedures employed in these modifications and the results obtained will permit the choice of the right mode of distribution in regards to both the various stages of production as well as the real and varying needs of society. It may also be possible that a partial destruction of the foundations of production as a consequence of the class struggle required for social transformation could rule out the distribution according to labor time without thereby rendering an egalitarian form of distribution impossible, by rationing, for example. And this egalitarian distribution may indeed be determined by the workers themselves, rendering the harsh necessity of labor time calculation unnecessary. But the fundamental principles assumes a normal communist economic system, that is, a system which has already been established and which is operating under its own conditions of reproduction. In such conditions, a form of distribution linked to labor time seems superfluous. Okay, so here we have our kind of our answer, Slavic, to what you were kind of wondering what he was getting on about. Let, let's read a, let's read a bit of a sentence here now. Yeah, so he talks here about about how you know, there's such waste in capitalism. Uh, and under a communism, you wouldn't have it. It is, it is clear then that under the conditions of a communist economy, so many consumption goods could be produced that any calculation of their individual shares of average socially necessary labor time will be superfluous. Like, uh, that's just such an irrational comment to be made by him. By, um, like, let, let's assume that they had done that in 1917 and said, look, efficiency or productivity, it doesn't matter, lads. It doesn't matter. We're in communists now. What would you have? You would have a stagnating, crappy communist system based upon like just producing stuff and giving it away with no planning with respect to like labor time or, you know, any of the productivity stuff that 
makes capitalism so productive that can also have socialist forms under the the communist principles we we have here in in the book so it's like it's just an incredibly it's it's an incredibly throwaway statement that that doesn't take on board the arguments in the book whatsoever he goes on and talks about how the production system would be modified after it was taken under control by communists which is yeah true it would uh, over time it would it would it could look very different it may be also possible he says that a partial destruction of the foundations of production as a consequence of the class struggle required for social transformation could rule out distribution according to labor time without thereby rendering an egalitarian form of distribution impossible by rationing okay so the economy gets so destroyed that we can't do labor time accounting and we have to ration yeah and you go fair enough in the short term short term i can fundamentally see that happening I've no problems with that you know it's happened in the capitalism during war and this egalitarian distribution may indeed be determined by the workers themselves rendering the harsh necessity of labor time calculation unnecessary i don't understand why it's a harsh necessity labor time calculation it seems to me like that it would be goddamn brilliant like why it's a harsh necessity like surely rationing is a harsh necessity being told exactly what you can or cannot consume versus you being able to work your days and consuming what you'd like this idea that rationing is somehow less harsh than your own self-directed consumption is a baffling statement for a communist but the fundamental principles assume a normal communist economic system that is a system which has already been established and which is operating under its own conditions of reproduction okay so yeah it, 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 he's talking about a settled kind of case here although there are parts in the book where they talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat being the labor the labor time planning being a part of the dictatorship of the proletariat a way of forcing people into the system yeah by the workers so it's not just so that's that's incorrect in such conditions okay uh things are all working well and normal a form of distribution to labor time seems superfluous so he's just completely rejecting any basis for labor time planning whatsoever he says that if things are rough well you have to do it some other way and then if things are good well labor time seems too rough it's a, a very 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 poorly constructed argument anybody have any comments on that then it strikes me as particularly with like all the global environmental issues like particularly concerning to say that you know we won't need some labor time calculation like you're going to need to build things to deal with to waste and and some of those projects could be quite large and i don't see how uh, why individual labor time wouldn't be factored in into you know how much consumption society is using or why why wouldn't it be important to measure yeah completely i i i can i concur 100% like imagine you want to say well we want to uh you know reforest and put plant a trillion trees and not be able to kind of see what your capacity is for doing such stuff it would seem to be a, a madness I think that's as far as we'll get today. We're five or six pages in. Unfortunately, we'll probably have to come back one more session. Uh, how do people feel about that? If you'd like to help fund the book that Donald and myself are writing about communist economic planning, please head over to the website the Classless Society in Motion.com where you can donate to our fund to help us get this book out in a finite time. Everybody who donates will get a signed copy of the book when it's released. So head on over there today and help us with this really important project. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, 
Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Thank you.